These are the notes on the metric system. Uh, just some things I want you to know about the metric system, which might appear on quizzes and on future assignments. Don't forget to download the file, play the slideshow, speaker on. Uh, for this, we normally have a more extensive assignment, but then I realized it was impractical to do it remotely. So all I'm going to have you do is watch these notes. There could be little tidbits in here that you'll be asked about later. And you can do additional research on the metric system as you, as you wish. And you're going to write a little paragraph describing the metric system, contrasting it with the standard system, and giving me at least four or five things you know about the metric system. It's a fairly simple assignment, one of our warm-up assignments. So just make sure to do a good job on it, and you can submit it on Schoology. The metric system is known as the international system, also as SI, and it is used in science. So the metric system is called the international system because it is used in many many, many, many parts of the world. There's only a very few places in the world, in fact, that do not use the metric system in their daily lives. And one of them, the biggest one, is the USA. Notice the countries that are in red on this map. Those are the only countries that do not use the metric system in their everyday business. So, unfortunately, the metric system is what science uses, and science is international. So this puts the U.S. in kind of a, a bad situation. It sets us back in science. When a student wants to learn science here, they first have to learn the metric system, like a second language, and then all the science that goes along with it. Unfortunately, this is a setback to us, and we have to overcome that. So notice there's very few other countries in the world that do not use the metric system in their daily lives. There's Liberia in Africa, and there's Myanmar, formerly Burma. Otherwise, pretty much everybody, at least mostly, uses the metric system. In order to illustrate the difference, the easiest way is when it comes to thermometers. If I show you the thermometer scale that we use, and contrast it with the one that is used in the metric system, it is very, very easy to see which one is better. The temperature scale that we are used to in the US is the Fahrenheit scale. Fahrenheit is a very difficult word to spell. Well, there it is written, but if you didn't see that, you'd probably make a few spelling errors. Um, now, how did Fahrenheit come up with his scale? Well, he used a pre-existing scale called Romer's scale. Romer wasn't worried about where temperatures fell. He just put marks on a glass rod full of mercury. And it just turned out on his thermometer, freezing was seven and a half and body temperature as he measured it was 22 and a half. Well, Fahrenheit didn't like fractions and he thought body temperature was one of those important temperatures you need to have on a whole number. And so it was freezing. So he thought, maybe I'll just multiply those by four to get rid of the fractions. That does get rid of the fractions. This was his initial temperature scale with 30 for freezing and 90 for body temperature. But then because of the mechanics of the time, the way they made thermometers, he needed those numbers to be divisible by two many, many times. So he made a slight modification multiplied by 1 and 1 15th, or 16 15ths, this is true, and that is the reason why 32 degrees is the freezing point of water. And that is the reason why 96 is body temperature. Oh, wait a second. No, it's not. He wanted it to be right on a degree, right on the 96. That would have been great for him. But unfortunately, Romer had measured his temperature inaccurately, or he was just a very cool guy. And so normal body temperature is actually 98.6 Fahrenheit, which is exactly what he was trying to avoid. 
So the problem with this is that 32 is freezing, 98.6 is body temperature. Do you even know what boiling is? The boiling temperature of water on Fahrenheit? A lot of people can't think of it off the top of their head. Think about it. Do you know what it is right now for sure? Well, this scale is just crazy. It was based on a scale that was badly measured and it was modified in strange ways for the wrong reasons. It didn't even work out. He didn't even get the body temperature to be on a whole degree, just like he was aiming for. Celsius, on the other hand, was a little bit interesting as well. He had the strange idea of measuring how cold it was rather than how hot it was. This doesn't really make sense. If you know thermodynamics, that doesn't really make much sense. But he was convinced that was the way to go. So he figured boiling and freezing were very important for water, boiling and freezing of water. He pegged those and he chopped the space between them into a hundred steps. And, he, and that's why it's sometimes called centigrade, which means a hundred steps. And he wanted zero for boiling and a hundred for freezing. Well, that seems strange. So actually they waited until he passed away. And then a very famous biologist named Linnaeus was actually the one who reversed the numbers and made the scale that we use today. Well, at least most countries in the world use today. You do see it on US weather reports, but it's always after the Fahrenheit. And that is the Celsius scale. 100 is boiling. How could you forget that? Zero is freezing. How could you forget zero? Zero and 100? That's such an easy scale to deal with. Very logical the way it was formed, except for the upside down part. But uh, mercury poisoning can do major damage to your brain. And some people suspect that's what happened with both of these guys. So Celsius is great for the most part. But there's an even better scale. The best of all scales is called Kelvin. Now you may not have heard of this scale. It is not used by any country in the world, but it is the preferred scale in science. Kelvin is based on Celsius. It has the same size degree as Celsius, but absolute zero is the new zero. Because you can get way colder than the freezing point of water. You could actually get 100 degrees colder than the freezing point of water. Could you get 200 degrees colder than the freezing point of water on the Celsius scale? Yes, you could. Could you get 300 degrees colder than the freezing point of water on the Celsius scale? No, because actually there is a lowest temperature and that temperature is negative 273 degrees Celsius. So why shouldn't that be zero? That is the real coldest temperature. So why not start measuring from there? And that is what is known as absolute zero. It sounds even colder in Fahrenheit because Fahrenheit degrees are tinier. So you fit a lot more of them in. So if, uh, in Fahrenheit, it's negative 460 degrees Fahrenheit. So Kelvin, sometimes we absolutely have to use it, pun intended, and we will uh, be using it at certain points in time but we usually avoid it for everyday things like measuring the temperature in a lab environment or the temperature outside. Usually we'll just stick with Celsius. But Fahrenheit is right out. Fahrenheit we should have gotten rid of a long time ago. It's just that we're used to it. We're stubborn. Someday, someday we'll probably switch to Celsius. So what is the boiling point of water on the Fahrenheit scale? Well, it's 100 Celsius. That's easy. That turns out to be 373 Kelvin. But what is it Fahrenheit? 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So a lot of people sort of don't know that. And think about it, that's an important temperature. When does water boil? So you go around and survey random people and say, what temperature does water boil at in Fahrenheit? And some of them might give you like 200, some might get it right, but a lot just don't know it because it's harder to remember than 100. It's just harder to remember. And then of course, ironically, Fahrenheit messed up getting body temperature on a whole degree. He got 98.6, but Celsius did it by accident. 
Turns out on the Celsius scale, average human body temperature is right on 37 degrees Celsius. So your temperature is probably 37 degrees Celsius plus or minus one degree Celsius. Um, younger people just generally have a slightly cooler temperature. And um, of course, unless you have a fever, it might be a little higher. So, um, and then of course, well, 32 is when water freezes in Fahrenheit. What is that in Celsius again? Well, of course, water freezes at zero degrees Celsius. You probably knew that one because we even say it's sub-zero. We even use that terminology, even though it doesn't really apply in the Fahrenheit scale. And zero degrees Celsius is actually 273 Kelvin. So for the most part, we're gonna use Celsius. That is the most useful scale. Kelvin is the best if you really get down to it, but we use it when we have to. So these things we're talking about, like degrees, Celsius, degrees, Fahrenheit, those are what we call units. A unit is the fundamental increment that we use to measure a quantity. So for example, if you're talking about something, it's like saying what the one is. Remember, unity means all one thing. So it's what the one is. Like if you're saying 37, 37 what? What is the one? Grams? 37 grams, or 37, 37 what? 37 meters, meters is the unit. So the unit is what you're measuring in. Are you measuring grams? Are you measuring meters? Are you measuring joules? Are you measuring liters? That is what you're using to measure with. Or as we just saw, you could use the degree on the Celsius scale, degree Celsius, which is actually quite a bit different than degrees Fahrenheit, Degrees Fahrenheit are about half the size of a degree Celsius. These are the ones you're more familiar with. We call it the standard system. It's also called the imperial system. It has many, many names, and it is a very ancient and organic system. It's changed over the years, so I'm going to sort of gloss over that. I just want to mention where some of these things come from because it's kind of interesting. A lot of these units come from body parts or from things that can be measured with your body, like pacing things out. So they had a, an important role to play in the past when we didn't have machinery to measure things, but they're very outmoded, outdated. First of all, what about length? In the standard system, we use the foot, which originally was a real foot. The only problem is if it was based on the king's foot, well, back when there were a lot of kings, every king had a different foot size, and so each country would have a different foot, which made trade very difficult. If you were trading a six-foot piece of wood between like Germany and France, well, you're gonna run into problems when it's not the right size for your country. So eventually they standardized it as the foot, which is 12 inches, but that was after a lot of years of trouble with using different feet in different countries. The mile, on the other hand, was not based directly upon the foot at all. Other than the fact that you had to move your feet in order to measure it, it was originally based on a thousand paces of a Roman legion. We're talking about ancient Rome. You know, thousands of years ago, they came up with the mile. The word in Latin is milia passuum, which means a thousand paces. A pace is two steps. So you could also say 2,000 steps. Now, a Roman legion has a bunch of so soldiers with different paces of their own, but if they're marching, it all evens out. And they would throw down a rock and make a mile marker. Then they take another thousand paces and throw it on a, um, another rock and mark it as another mile marker. So the mile goes way, way back, but it wasn't based directly on the foot, so it doesn't come out to be a nice number. Do you know how many feet are in a mile? I'm talking about a statute mile, what we use to measure the distance on land between cities, for example. Well, a statute mile doesn't have a nice round number. In fact, it turns out to be, did you know this? 
5,280 feet. To complicate matters, they came up with a different mile for use in the ocean called the nautical mile, and the nautical mile has a totally different length. It was based on the length of the equator, and the nautical mile turns out to be 6,080 feet. So notice how different those are. They're almost, they're about 800 feet different, right? 800 feet different, that's a big difference. So miles, converting to feet, like if I said, okay, how many feet are in 77 miles? You're like, oh boy, and then you have to write it down, you know, do the conversion using the 5,280. Well, it turns out that is an issue with the mathematics in the standard system. Nothing converts really, really easily. So the system of feet and miles, etc., the standard system, the imperial system, that held sway until a little something called the French Revolution. Now, I don't know if you remember when the French Revolution happened, but it was actually after the American Revolution, kind of right after, in 1789. And, well, they didn't like having a system that was based on, for other, among other things, the king's foot. They kind of got rid of the king, to be blunt. Um, and they wanted to start things over. They wanted to get a better system of measurement. So this is actually where the metric system originated. It came in the aftermath of the French Revolution, and then it spread around the world. A lot of the other things they did were at least temporarily reversed, but the metric system continued to gain hold around the world right through to today. They decided to base their unit of measurement not on a king, but on something much bigger on the planet we live on. At the time, they had a pretty good understanding of the size of the Earth, and they knew about the distance if you were to travel directly from the pole along the surface down to the equator. Let's say you could skim over the ocean, flatten out the mountains. They knew what the distance was, and they said, well, if we were to chop that into small enough pieces, like divide it by, I don't know, 10 million, then you would wind up with something that would easily fit between your two hands or in your two hands. Now let's face it, they were going for something that was similar to the yard, which was a common measurement at the time that was three feet. And so the meter, of course, had to be somewhere in that range. But a meter is bigger than a yard, okay? Um, a meter is one ten millionth of the distance from the pole to the equator. That is the way that it was defined. And then of course, to go all the way around the earth, you could go all the way around the Earth if you had how many meters? 40 million meters would get you around the Earth. That's why the Earth, if you talk about its circumference, is around 40,000 kilometers. They knew that they might be wrong about the size of the Earth, but they didn't want their meter fluctuating based on new discoveries. Oh, the Earth turns out to be a little bigger or a little smaller, that would have changed the meter. So instead, they had all this leftover platinum. I mean, they just raided the king's palace at Versailles. So they made a platinum meter stick. That's pretty pricey. And they decided that even if they were slightly wrong about the size of the earth, that wouldn't matter. The meter would remain the same. So for a long time, that stick, that platinum meter stick was the standard for the meter until later they defined it based on the speed of light. So that platinum meter stick is actually located even today in a museum. Where do you think that museum is? It's in France. What's the biggest city in France? Paris. So that platinum meter stick is located in a museum in Paris, France. Then, this is where things get clever. They decided, well, we've already got a unit of distance. So let's come up with a unit of volume, like measuring how much space there is inside of a box or how much liquid is in a container. 
we need something to measure volume. And the clever thing they did is they based the volume on the length. That is something that we do not do in the standard system. I didn't go into that, but that's another complication with the standard system. So they took a little box that was 10 centimeters on a side, 10 centimeters. Now you'll see why we're using centimeters all of a sudden in a moment. And that box, if it has 10 centimeters on each side, a cube, the volume of that box is one liter, kind of like liquid meter, because a lot of times volumes will hold liquids. So the liter was the unit of volume that they chose to use. And then when it came to measuring mass, uh, what they decided to do was also base it on the unit of length, which in turn had made the unit of volume. And then what's the most common substance on the surface of the earth? The most common substance anywhere on the surface of the earth is of course water. And if you put water into a tiny little cube, one centimeter on a side, then that is the definition of a gram. The mass of that is one gram. Or if you were to fill up the liter, if you fill up the whole liter with water, well, then that gives you a thousand grams or a kilogram. And so what they did is they figured a gram is a little hard to get right. So let's make the kilogram the standard. They made a platinum kilogram. Yes, again, the platinum. And they decided that would be the official kilogram even if they had measured a little bit inaccurately. So notice that the kilogram was based on the liter, the liter was based on the meter, the meter was based on the earth. It all kind of followed very logically, okay? Unlike the standard system, which was just like some guy's foot, how far these guys walk, and a bunch of other random things thrown together. So when we use units, the unit is the fundamental increment we use to measure a quantity, as I mentioned before, like a gram or a meter or a joule or a liter. But sometimes we need to modify our units. So first of all, let's look at the units. For length, the meter. For mass, the gram. For time, they still use seconds. They decided not to mess with the clock they could have tried to make that based on multiples of 10, like everything else is, but um, they decided people aren't gonna go for it. Uh, temperature, Kelvin, or of course, Celsius is more often used in everyday experiments. Volume is the liter, and energy is the joule. We will be seeing all of these things, okay? Now notice there is a standard abbreviation for each one. Some of them are lowercase letters, some of them are capital letters, like Kelvin is capital, Joule is capital, and liter, it turns out, could go either way. You can do it capital or lowercase l. Then what they did to modify these units, because using a meter can be pretty clunky if you're measuring your toenail, it's a little bit too big, so you probably want a smaller measurement. So they came up with all the prefixes that modify your unit. Some of them you might not be familiar with, like deci. Deci would be a tenth of a unit, like a decimeter is a tenth of a meter. You're probably more familiar with centimeters. Centimeters are hundredths of a meter. Just remember, there are a hundred cents in a dollar, and there's a hundred centimeters in a meter. Millimeter is a thousandth. And then you may have heard of Micro, a micrometer is even smaller. It's a millionth of a meter. A nanometer is a billionth of a meter. And a picometer, very, very tiny, is a trillionth of a meter. So that's if you're measuring things on different scales. Like what if you're measuring something inside of an atom? You wanna use one of the smaller ones, right? And what if you're measuring something on your table? Well, then you're gonna use one of the maybe milli or centi. And what if you're measuring something in a room, you probably want to use just the unit itself, like meters. Then what if you're measuring something big? They have prefixes that modify the unit, like kilo, you've probably heard of this one, like kilometer, 
okay? It's actually kilometer, but we say it all the time. So the ones that we say a lot, we often make it into an everyday word like kilometer, okay? There's mega, which is a million times. There's giga, which is a billion times bigger. And then tera, which is a trillion times bigger. So you might not have heard of these in terms of meters, but you've probably heard of these in computing in terms of bytes, like megabytes, gigabytes, and terabytes. So that gives you a sense of how big a terabyte is. It's a trillion bytes. It's a really, really big number, okay? And now we're seeing that number more and more frequently in our everyday lives. So if you have your base unit, like meter, you can modify it with a prefix. If I put an M in front of it, if there's two letters, then the first one is always the prefix. That's millimeters, that's thousandths of a meter. KM, that's kilometers, that's thousand meters, that's a thousand times bigger than a meter. So we measure kilometers, measure between cities, between towns. And then of course, you know centimeters, that's the one people are most familiar with in the US. It shows up on many of your rulers and centimeters are good for measuring things like the length of a pencil or a remote control, something like that. So the ones on a meter stick or on a ruler that are numbered are the centimeters. The little tiny markings in between them are the millimeters. Now notice there are 10 millimeters in each centimeter. So these multiples of 10 make conversions really quickly, uh, really quick. For example, what if I had seven centimeters? Well, I know that's 70 millimeters. If I have 120 millimeters, that's 12 centimeters. All you have to do is move the decimal around, just drop a zero or pick up a zero. It's pretty easy to convert. You can do the same exact thing with other units in the metric system, like the gram. You can put M in front of it, that's milligram. That's a thousandth of a gram. You can put kilo in front of it, K in front of it, kilogram. That's a thousand grams. A lot of people think of a kilogram as about 2.2 pounds, but pounds is actually a weight and kilograms is a mass, but under normal earth gravity, they're roughly equivalent. So it's okay to think about, think about it like that in a general sense. And then there are centigrams, hundredths of a gram. That's usually what our lab balances measure to in our lab room, which sadly we are missing right now. You can do the same thing with liters, milliliters, kiloliters, we don't see those a lot, and centiliters. The one we see the most here is the milliliters. We measure those all the time. So those are the notes on the metric system. So now I'd like you to just write a short paragraph about contrast the metric system with the standard system. You can include things I did not mention in these notes. I did leave a lot of things out. You can even watch other resources, other videos about the metric system and include things I did not mention and submit it on Schoology. Pretty easy assignment. And we're just getting started with some of these warm up assignments.